Just to adjust this, just to have you in it, I can't see you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? How's that? Making sure this is for you. Sure. How's that? We'll have people put both on. They can do that too. Yeah. All right, that's Speak out for you. Um, so we're gonna put actually put both in here. That's okay because this one is going to come through here and this is going to be through the live stream. Okay. They're not going to. I don't think so, but if they do, then we will turn it on. Hello. I don't think they're here. Try to put it up on. Okay. I could turn them. Testing. I'm not so sure. Hello. Hello. Testing, testing. I don't know if it's coming through. Hello, hello. No, it's dead. When you blow on it, sounds. That's about it. Yeah. Testing, testing. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, much can can uh, is the mic coming through? It's kind of raspy, huh? Maybe I just speak loud. So it's just here. Okay, um, can uh, everyone take a seat? I have to yell because the uh, mic system is not working, or is it working? Um, oh yeah, hello. Oh, it sounds terrible. I feel like I got COVID or something. Okay, so on behalf of everyone, including the uh, our including our distinguished faculties from. Korea, as well as the uh, United States, and uh, those of you from uh, Amplify uh, Surgical, uh, welcome to our fall uh, dual portal endoscopic spine surgery symposium. Um, the event, we're, little, we're starting a little late because we're having some uh, audiovisual issues, and I'll try to catch up. Before I start, I'm gonna introduce our panelists, our faculty members. Uh, we'll start with the uh, faculties from Korea. Um, Dr. Char Ung Park, Park Chol Ung, please stand up, please. Uh, is from Daejeon Uri Hospital. Um, Dr. Ha Dong Ha uh, comes from Seoul Bumin Hospital. And Dr. Zhang Jae Won from Leon Wiltsi Memorial Hospital in Suwon. And we also have our faculty members from the state, uh, Dr. Kaku Baiko from Houston. Is Dr. Kwan here yet? He must be stuck in traffic, huh? He was supposed to be driving down from uh, Boston. Hopefully he'll join us shortly. Um, and we also have Dr. Daniel Park from Michigan. And we have Dr. Park Don Young uh, joining us via uh, internet, and he'll be giving us his own portion of the uh, lecture uh, that was previously recorded. 
Right. Okay. So without further ado, we'll start. Um, just a couple of housekeeping business and just a reminder. And just also to set your uh, expectations correctly. I don't want you guys to think that by the end of today, you're going to be the guru of bipolar endoscopic spine surgery in your hospital. No way. Maybe Martin will be because he's very good. But um, today is like going to a restaurant getting an appetizer sampler, right? You're just looking at the menu like, woo, but you only have budget to buy one appetizer, and that's what you're going to get. You're going to see our masters at work. You're going to see how once you get there, how useful, how, you know, this surgery can really enhance uh, your volume and indications, but not to get you good at it. There's no way. This isn't different than going to a weekend course and seeing a different expendable cage as opposed to the static cage that you were using for last few years. This is very different. Oh, excuse me. Different techniques. Oh, I messed up already. <laughs> How do I make this smaller? Can somebody help me? But anyways, uh, so that's your expect. So we have two laps, okay? We have morning lap schedule, and then we're going to break for lunch. And then we have our afternoon, thank you, afternoon lap, right? Ooh. Um, and the morning lab is going to be mostly watching, right? We can't, you can't really expect to do anything until you actually watch someone do it in person. So the first lab will be that, all right? Okay, you're going to see our professors do a, 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 a case. And after which, in the afternoon, now that you've seen it, you do one, right? That's our orthopedic dictum, right? Or your surgery dictum, too. Um, so that's how it's going to flow. And uh, just to start off, I'm just going to talk about my own experience of how I got to be where I am, which is like I'm in the really beginning phase of uh, bipolar endoscopic spine surgery. So why is it that, you know, folks in Korea, India, China, South America, they're like taking this uh, technique and just doing everything with it? And that in the States, most people don't even know what the heck it is. Most people get this confused with percutaneous surgery, unipodal surgery, this and that. And there are many reasons, right? And many, you know, our uh, faculty members will touch upon that. But in my own view, there is a significant learning curve that's involved and you got to invest your time and effort into it. But the thing is, there's no financial incentive. You know, I could do a simple lamy in 30, 40 minutes and get paid the same money as take two hours to do this case and with frustrations and all that stuff. So initially, there's no financial incentive. Most of our technology, at least in the States, were industry-driven, right? So a company would come up with the different cages and whatnot and boom, 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 push it, you know, make it look like it's the best thing since a slice of bread. But there is no industry sponsorship because you're utilizing techniques or technologies that's already in existence. So strikers of the world and arthrocare couldn't care less whether this is going to take off now because they got the whole sports industry in, you know, under them. So, And the other thing is lack of learning opportunities such as this. Shit, this thing is in the bad space for someone who likes to use his hand. Um, um, Really, I mean, even when I heard about this, you know, type of tech, surgical technologies, that really, like, I, I didn't have any connections in the beginning. There was no way for me to reach out to somebody and say, hey, you know, how, how, where do I go see one of these things? So the lack of learning opportunities. And there's also this misconception by the established surgeons that go on Biomedis and they go on all the national panels without even having seen one of these cases in person. And they don't even know what the heck they're talking about. And yet, condemn the techniques. Oh, I could do everything with the tube, you know, blah, blah, blah. They have no idea what they're saying because they really don't. So that, I think, also contributed to uh, the fact that we're so far behind. But I think we could certainly catch up. Um, so my own experience, I'm going to just briefly touch upon it, right? So I've been in practice for 23 years. And when I first, you know, was training percutaneous discectomy with nucleotome, it's literally a nucleotome. There's a machine that goes ka-ching, 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 sucking out the nucleus. Sucked, right? 
unpredictable outcomes. Some people go, woo, some people go, oh, no good. And then came IDET in 1998, again advertised as like God's gift to spine surgeons. Bullshit, right? So the biggest sucker was the guys who bought that company for whatever hundreds of millions of dollars. What was that, Medtronics? Or, uh, no, I think it was the, uh, whatever, they lost money. And then was the Arthrocare Spine One, which I kind of played with. I did use IDET, I did try Spine One, I did try Strike a Decompressor, doesn't work. Unpredictable outcome, that's the problem. So there come, and then there's Uniportal System, which has been around for many, many, many years. Why didn't that take off? Well, how many of you here have taken courses in either Joymax or Wolf System? Look, how many of you guys actually have incorporated that into your practice in a routine basis? Zero. I have taken so many of these courses, but I don't have the guts to practice it on my patient because it's just impossible unless somebody else is there to really guide you, hold your hand, and things like that, right? So big, big learning curve, and that's why that has not translated. So in 2014, you know, I... After making a few phone calls, I was able to uh, visit Uridu Gyeongwon, which is the, the premier at that time, hospital in Korea, stood there like dummy and watched the procedures being done, came back thinking I could do it. No way. Just watching it, there's no way you could do this. So how did I come, you know, uh, come across this opportunity? First, you know how like you, based on your interest, you get the Facebook feed? I got from this society so I registered as a member and then I started seeing all these videos of all these crazy cases being done with the scope with unbelievable dexterity and visualization the whole thing but you know you could only watch videos right you're watching porn you're just watching it what the heck you know like I want some hands-on experience is this being recorded but anyway so there comes Andy Choi, whom I had known for many years, and I was telling him about this dual portal stuff. He goes, Dr. Kim, I didn't know you were interested in those minimal invasive, you know. I said, like, why? Because you kind of like, you know, past the prime or past the age where you should. Like, what are you talking about? You know, I always been interested. So anyways, Andy hooked me up, and just around that time is when he was actually organizing this very inaugural symposium. So I was able to attend that. And I just like I said, it was an appetizer. I needed to go for the main course. So we, you know, me, uh, Brian Kwan, who just got here eating his bagel, and Don Parr from UCLA, uh, and Andy organized the trip. So this summer we went there, and this is how I got involved. So two hospitals we uh, visited was Dr. Park's Hospital, uh, Tejan Woody Hospital, and Dr. Ho's hospital, which is Hall Boomin Hospital. And it was a totally different experience than 2014, where I was just standing there for two days. We live and breathe endoscopic spine surgery for five days. Oh, this is unbelievable. It's like Avatar 2. This is 3D. You're watching, you're like flying through the spinal canal, seeing all these vessels and ligaments that you never, ever appreciate. And this is courtesy of Dr. Ha. And then, guess what? It's Korea. This is what you get to do. Can't do that here. You go to jail. You lose your license. <laughs> Look at this. This is not, this is actually on a bleeding person. So watch one, do one, teach one, right? So this is me come back. I saw one. I did one. I'm like a deer looking at a headlight. What the f am I doing? So I take this picture, send it to my colleagues, like, dude, I tried, I just couldn't do it. And he rightly points out, look, look at the angle of the scope, man. You probably were disoriented. You're like 90 degrees off. Oh, shit. So next case, this is me successfully doing the second case, only successful cases so far. So in summary, dual portal endoscopic surgery is, surgery is a real deal, having seen it, having tried to do it, and still in its infancy. This symposium, I guarantee you, is just going to whet your appetite. This is not going to make you a guru. You got to visit the Mecca. And the professors here that are uh, visiting us from Korea will love to have you. They're the most gracious hosts 
I have ever visited. So therefore, use this lab as an opportunity to make the connections, exchange business cards, get their business card, and the trip will be the point person. So once you get your appetite and you want to go for the main course, you got to get in touch with this guy and he will make it happen. So that's uh, my talk, and then we'll move on to the real talk. Um, so first, better up is Dr. Brian Kwan, uh, who's going to talk to us about dual portal endoscopic spine surgery. Introduction. Yeah, just hold up right now. Okay, cool. <clears throat> okay, good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little late. Um, thanks for having me, and thank you to Amplify uh, for putting on this meeting. Um, it's great to see everyone. I haven't seen some of you in a while. Uh, and it's good to see our colleagues from Korea. Um, <clears throat> we're going to kind of talk about them and brag about them a lot. Um, and there's, there's actually pretty good reason for that. Um, and as you'll hear throughout many of your talks, their impact on me has, and, and you've already heard what uh, uh, Dr. Kim just said, has been profound. And uh, I, you know, again, with tremendous gratitude and thanks, I, you know, you know, say to Dr. Hud, Dr. Park, um, thank you, not just for your investing in me, but how much you've invested in this technology and this technique worldwide, really. And you, if you go to this UBE, uh, World UBE Society, I mean, there are surgeons from all over the world who are really getting excited about this technique and this, I don't even call it this technology, it's technique. Um, and so really, uh, it, it, you know, I, I can't really thank them enough. It's great. Just no, sorry. You're good. Oh, okay. Okay. Excellent. This is where I can do a little dance routine later, right? Yes. So I'm all, okay, perfect. Yeah, exactly. I'll do my. I'll do my best uh, BTS uh, impression here. Okay. So anyway, so, uh, you know, like Young and, and maybe many of you and likely many of you, when I first started to think, well, you know, endoscopic spine surgery is, is really the next <clears throat> sort of iteration, right? It's, it's, it's accretive, like knowledge, technology, getting better at this stage happens in, in very, very small increments. And so if you believe in just the concept of minimally invasive surgery, it is a natural tendency for you to think about, well, wh where does endoscopic surgery fit into my armamentarium? <clears throat> but the first thing that I had to figure out was what is it? And, and like anything, like many things, we, we think about divisions along corporate lines. So if you say Joymax or Yes or, or Wolf, you, you think, well, that's a different procedure. But really, as doctors, you're not thinking, well, I'm going to do a Wolf today and tomorrow I'm going to do a Joymax. Like, no, no, no. We, we think about the patient, the pathology and how to treat it. And so within the realm of endoscopic spine surgery, and I think this is a reasonable um, sort of way to, to address the nomenclature of what all these things we are doing and talking about and sort of the alphabet soup that we face when we're learning about endoscopic spine surgery. This is what we're talking about, unilateral biportal endoscopic surgery, which falls under the endos endoscopy-assisted surgery, which not unreasonable, but just to put the, the groundwork in front of everybody here so that there's there's no confusion. So What's the difference? Well, the, the obvious answer, of course, is, you know, on the right is a, you know, now what I call uniportal surgery. And on the left is biportal or dual portal, which is what we're talking about today. So <clears throat> um, 
you know, ultimately, what is it? Well, it's endoscopic spine surgery with two ports, okay, where you have a viewing port and a working port. And uh, uh, I'm not paid to pitch this textbook, but uh, I would recommend you uh, look this textbook up. It's, it's not super pricey. And, you, you know, I, I, my only regret is I forgot to bring it so I can have these two guys sign it for me. <laughs> but uh, uh, in it has a, a really a, a, a better than most uh, photographs, uh, radiographs, and then there are actually links to videos that you can watch, um, you know, uh, on your computer, obviously. Um, and it, it really goes into the very basics of uh, bilateral decompressions to even more advanced techniques like cervical, thoracic, uh, you know, fusions, which we'll hear a little bit about. But <clears throat> uh, there's a little, there are a couple subtle differences in dual portal en endoscopy compared to uniportal endoscopy. Um, and I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to go into a lot of it. And I don't mean to constantly bring up uniportal endoscopy, but I think it's important for us to conceptualize that there are some distinct differences uh, despite the obvious. Um, but basically, you know, the, the steps are not dissimilar from, let's say, doing shoulder arthroscopy where you establish your ports, uh, you know, you, you, you blow water in there. And we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about sun space a lot. I, I'm, I'm sure it's pronounced sun, but I'll call it sun space because uh, if I keep saying sun, you're going to think, you know, something else. But uh, and for those of you who don't speak Korean, and you know, like me, it <laughs> just comes out the other way. Anyway, so, you know, what do you need to get started? Okay, first of all, you need one of these, okay? And I'm pretty sure everybody here has seen one of these, right? This is really common. This is as common in almost any hospital or surgery center as an x-ray machine is or should be. It's an arthroscopy tower. And you think, well, okay. Sounds reasonable. Well, yeah, okay. And and I put this list up here primarily because if and when you when you guys when you folks go back to your hospital administrators and say, well, you know, I just learned about this new procedure I'm really excited about. What's the first thing you know the administrator thinks is, okay, what's this doctor asking for, and how much is it going to cost us, right? So as soon as you say to them though, just look at their face and you say, well, most of what I need is already back there. They'll go, oh, okay, great. And the conversation ends, right? So yes, you, you need an RF device, okay? And I, again, I can almost guarantee you probably have them in multiple different sizes, shapes, and flavors, okay? You need a drill. You can use whatever brand you want. Uh, I typically use one from Arthrex, despite the fact that most of our equipment is ConMed. Uh, because that drill works best for me. Again, not a pitch for Arthrex. It's just the shape and size that works best. Uh, and in all truth, while you know Dr. Hu and Dr. Park were operating, I was snapping lots of photos of of the drills, and um, I really thought about shoving one in my pocket and bringing it back to the states. But I try not to do illegal things um, as frequently uh, anymore. So you need pump and pump tubing, of course. And look, those are all disposables, right? But those are disposables. Remember, you know, the administration of the hospital is thinking, what's my baseline cost? And so as soon as you just say arthroscopy, endoscopy, you know, these things, these costs are already baked in. And so really what they're going to look at you for is what additional costs am I going to incur for you to do this operation? As of right now, that number is zero. And funny enough, I was looking this up and it turns out you can buy these on eBay. You can use Google Pay, you can use PayPal, Visa, or MasterCard for the ripe old price of $27,000. Um, so if you want to buy one yourself, I mean, you probably could. Uh, all right, so what else do you need? Well, you need scopes, uh, and I mentioned that. And the only reason why I bring this up as a separate slide is because I noticed Dr. Hu and Dr. Park use zero-degree scopes. In the United States, 30-degree scopes are most common. In fact, in my main hospital, we don't even have zero-degree scopes. I do most, I'm starting to do most of these in my ASC where I get zero degree scopes there. I, I will tell you, it changes the perspective. And I, I think each surgeon here will have to decide for yourself 
which one you're more most comfortable with. I can tell you that when I was operating with these gentlemen, the, the perspective was, was different, but there are certain advantages of both. Uh, and I think ideally it probably best to have both available. <clears throat> uh, and certainly again, if you have them in your hospital, well, I lied. So we do have zero degree scopes, but they're the hip scopes that are like, you know, this long. And so I'd be, you know, like I'm playing the cello or something like that. So, uh, I, you know, and, and again, it's on that really literally on that same eBay page and, and you can even get a, 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 a 5% off code with patient nine monitor, um, uh, and, you know, in terms of other equipment, I will tell you, and because this is an Amplify course, I'll do a shameless plug for Andy's uh, Amplify kit. We call it the Amplify box because it's one box, but it basically has everything you need. Um, this tool up here is a little, uh, it's like a scraper that uh, I'm going to talk about at length, actually. Um, you have your pituitaries, your standard um, uh, kerosens, which actually this is uh, uh, similar to a Koros kerosen where it's a rotating kerosen. Uh, straight, sort of your standard 40, 90 degree and curved kerosen, uh, which was, uh, again, something like Young was talking about, when you're just watching the videos, you don't appreciate when you watch these gentlemen, how they use even the curved and the 90 degree kerosens at particular spots. And, and when you're living and breathing this, you know, five days in a row, you start to see subtle differences in their technique. So those things are, you know, important to have. But you know, again, what hospital where you do spine doesn't have a 90 degree kerosene, doesn't have a 40 degree kerosene, doesn't have a curved kerosene. So your startup costs can be de minimis when you really want to get this thing going. And here's one place. So is anybody familiar with the company Eloquence, which is just right up the street here, right? Their business model is that they use a lease model for their uniportal set, which is how they compete against the Wolves and the, and the Joy Maxes, you know, who ask you to buy a half a million dollar tower and equipment. Um, you know, not to, you know, shoot Andy in the foot here, but you don't have to have this kit. Now I will say this kit makes a lot of things easier. Um, and I, I believe at the end of the meeting, you'll also get a code that you get 5% off. Uh, if you ask him later, uh, online, right. You take Google pay and Apple pay as well for the kit. Perfect. All right. Um, and then what about room setup? Okay. Because same thing, they're going to say, well, you know, you know, when they were like, well, I, I don't understand. Like, what do you, you're, you're doing spine surgery, you're arthroscopy, tired. like what is going on? Uh, very simple. Um, for bipodal, certainly as you get started, standing on the left side is the preferred side, if you're, in particular, if you're a right-handed surgeon. Okay, so your viewing port is in your left hand, your working port is in your right. So most of us, we use our kerosen with our right hand, we use our Penfield 4 with our right hand, we use a drill with our right hand. Okay, so the viewing port, is similar to a knee arthroscopy, for example, is done the same way with your basket punch when you're taking out a meniscus or you're sticking an arrow in. You're all doing that with your right hand. Your viewing port is kind of stable. And, you know, that just probably comes from the tradition of, you know, most people in general being right-handed. So my work order, or sorry, my setup is that I stand on, on, on the right, and there's my, my scrub nurse, and all the rest of the equipment stands opposite. So I bring the C-arm in, I do my skin markings, we prep and drape, and then I take my lead off. I don't wear my lead either. So that's another huge advantage, by the way. You don't like wearing lead in the OR, even for a shorter case. But I guarantee you, your first cases are going to take a long time, which is going to get frustrating. Only worse because you're wearing lead, you're sweating, and you know, you're know just not a happy place, right? At least for me. So, <clears throat> And then I flip to a lateral. I've got a needle in there. And then I make my incision. I create my working space, my sun space. I put a marker in there, shoot another fluoro, and the C-arm comes out, it's gone. And then we bring the scope tower down and actually we connect all our tubes from the top and then you just get started. Okay, so you think about the work order of like, if you're doing a micro disc and, and I use a spinal needle, I mark the skin, I do, you know, it's, it's not any different in terms of an investment in time, investment in effort uh, and, it, and you know, you know what else is really great about these scope towers? You know, how many times have you had a, a nurse or a circulator, surgical tech walk in your room? Dr. Kwan, I'm just the ophthalmology nurse here. I've never done a spine case. Oh, well, great. That means you have a lot of room to grow today, don't you? Right? You know, you're, you're like, why the hell are you tell me that? I, I don't care, you know? Like, but, but what they're kind of conceding, they're sort of admitting early on to themselves. They're just letting themselves fail. 
But you have a nurse who comes in, well, I do only do shoulders, but hey, I know how to plug all this stuff in. I know what white balance is. I know what, you know. And so even for your staff, it, um, it, it's tremendously helpful. So your markers are basically right here. Um, you want the, the cranial margin of your lower pedicle and the medial wall of that same lower pedicle. Okay, that to me is the key mark. And you do it, they do it on a AP fluoro image. Okay, and you, and you don't necessarily, you know, can't the machine because it's really how you're going to approach that interspace from where you're standing. And I think that was one of my biggest, bigger learnings when I was watching it being done. And you'll see it in the lab today. I like to mark midline and the caudal border of the upper pedicle just so I understand where my decompression zone is. So, but basically this is what you're looking at, right? You're looking at skin with a, an X and that's where my spinal needle initially goes in. And, um, you know, everybody has a slightly different way of doing it. Uh, I like Dr. Park's way where he kind of takes his finger and he taps the needle down very, very slowly until you reach the lamina. It's a positive stop. So that when you switch to a lateral, your spinal needle should be somewhere around the upper, you know, cranial third, cranial half of the pedicle, um, basically, or at the very caudal margin of the uh, upper lamina. And that's where you make your initial skin incision. That's really where life starts in these cases. So, and, and I suspect you will hear more lectures on this. Your viewing port now, <laughs> one, one thing in, in their textbook that they talk about is they say, well, you, you make your next incision about two to three centimeters cranial to that. Let me tell you, uh, elderly women in South Korea have a very, very different BMI than at least, you know, patients in Eastern Massachusetts or, you know, I, I, you know wherever you all are from. Uh, you know, I have friends in North Carolina where, you know, they, they, they've, they've never seen somebody with a BMI of 22. So um, in terms of where your incisions go, it's a little bit of a learning curve. And obviously it's a, it's a guesstimate in terms of how much more cranial you need to be. But the goal is the, the concept of triangulation, right? You need to get your instruments to meet sort of at the same spot, right? It, it's like, um, you guys remember the old Philadelphia Eagles, the Buddy Ryan defense, they, never mind. Anyways, uh, they, they'd have these defense events would sit way on the outside, they call it the nine technique. And they would just basically converge right on the quarterback. Um, and it worked uh, uh, very, very frequently and very well. But um, and then creating the working space, which uh, I'm sure our, 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 our professors will talk about even more. But if you look at the axial MRI at the level that you're operating at, every lamina has this little sort of fatty area that you can take advantage of. And that's sun's space. Um, and, and you'll see it in the lab. It's hard for me to kind of describe here. How much time do I have left? Yeah, minus five. Minus five? Okay. <laughs> Good. Good thing these videos are short. Okay. So this is me trying to do this uh, two years ago. Uh, that's, the, that's the L4 lamina, believe it or not. See how dirty it is? And that's my, that's my probe finally going in, okay? Um, now, here's what it looks like now. You see that? This is the right side, but see that four lamina? And this is actually facet capsule, okay? And then you can see there's an actual space in here. Uh, and that's really what you're going for. And that's really the way to get started. We're going to skip the next. Uh, so um, this, is, this is very familiar to you as a surgeon. Um, it's two-handed surgery, as we say. Uh, the startup costs are really quite de minimis. And you know, there, you'll hear about all the other applications moving forward. Uh, and personally, I find it to be very fun surgery. So thank you very much.
Uh, hello, hello everyone. Can you hear me? <coughs> uh, I am part from South Korea. Just before I change the uh, the topic for presentation, because uh, Dr. Brunker so already told me <coughs> the topic is very similar with uh, my topics. So uh, I would like to show you the live video instead, instead of uh, instead of uh, uh, PPT presentation. I would like to show you my live video. So firstly. Uh, it was done in early this year. So my patient has a right side, right side compression on uh, posterior lateral area and also have a foramen area. This is CT view. Yes, this is a vacuum, vacuum, and uh, also have a yeah, compression hole here. It means uh, there are two root compression, or right side L5 root and right side S root by uh, whole disc and uh, vacuum. Yeah. So before operation, we need we have a, with a spinal leader, we check the rubber and uh, decide the side uh, location for skin incision. Usually there is uh, two types of skin incision. One is longitudinal, the other one is uh, transverse skin incision. Transverse skin incision is more better for the fluid movement, but long, for beginner, longitudinal skin incision is more better because you can change the open microscope surgery. So I'm talking about the perfect uh, angle of uh, skin incisions. Sorry for my English, but I, I will try my best to explain this surgery. Now I'm uh, getting skin incisions. Usually I, I have a skin incision just lateral to the midline. And the location of skin incision is the same as the brown cones uh, presentation. Transverse skin incision, and uh, with a balloon tip, and then I usually, I make, with a balloon tip, I palpate the interlaminar space, upper lamina and lower lamina, and also uh, touch the ligament flavor. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm starting my uh, live surgery. So it is a broadcast pro with uh, YouTube for, or for the other country. So with a uh, I am checking the times for surgery. And I am palpating with a blue tip of uh, some <coughs> instrument. It's very easy to the palpate the upper lamina and lower lamina, and also touch the ligand flavor. And uh, I'm inserting trochus cannula for the scope port. And I am dilating, I am making port for dilating port for working because I am right side hand surgeon. So left side standing is more easy. And dilating and making working space over the lamina. And also insert the trochus to cannula for the workings. Yeah, and then insert and score. 
making tunnel is very important. Uh, imp imp uh, fluid input must be fluid output. So there always there are movement movement of fluid. That is the ba basic of dual photon surgery. And uh, this is this is a lamina. And this is a RF. Big benefit of uh, dual photon surgery is uh, using RF. RF. Radio frequency, elevation, and coagulation is very useful, and uh, it generates low heat compared to other open surgery. So this is a low margin of upper lamina. And usually I start drilling for spiro lamina junction at 11 o'clock here. Because I stand on the left side, nine o'clock is cranial, and three o'clock is caudal, and uh, six o'clock is left side, and uh, 12 o'clock is midline. I'm, I'm drilling. I'm drilling upper lamina. This is the L5 lamina. I like to use the cutting bar, uh, uh, this drill. This drill has a suction holes. So, Self suction. This this drill has holes for suction, so bone debris, other materials are gushed out with the fluid. So I can keep the visual field clearly. When I start start drilling, usually uh, I drill continue to drill for uh, five or six minutes or over the ten minutes because this drill has uh, suction holes. Next up, uh, uh, here is a ligand flab, and uh, here is a lamina. Uh, I'm drilling up for lamina. This is the L5 lamina. At this time, we have to find uh, where is the midline. Where is the midline? With the drilling, we can find the epidural fat. Knowing midline is uh, very important. Every doctor knows uh, where am I, where am I is very important. So we drill, we can find midline at, uh, here. Yeah. We are near the, maybe, we drill. And then find the midline. And here is the imperial articular process. And before operation, I inject the intercoming for make sure the correct levels. And finally, you find the epidural fat here. So I definitely, 100%, here is the midline. So after getting the point of midline, we can drill right side and left side. So six o'clock is the left side, and uh, 12 o'clock is the right side. I'm drilling right side sublaminal plastic. I'm drilling contralateral lamina. I'm stopping my drill, and uh, I confirm. I confirm the correct level again. I'm checking here. First look at here. We are only six minutes, we are here. And check CM for time saving. And uh, I start, after confirming the correct level, I start to restart the drillings. This is a uh, uh, right side uh, lamina. And with uh, every speed, Okay. Usually, uh, for this patient, th I, I have to check, uh, decompress the two root, right side, right side L5 root and right side S1 root. So 
I am drilling, I am drilling right side sublamina area. Here is a right side SAP. Let's go. Yeah, I'm I'm removing right side ligament flavor. Yeah, look at this. This is very important. Here is, here is the right side superior articular process. We can detach the ligament flavor from right side ligament uh, right side superior articular process with a curette. This is the midline ligament. Epidural and detach. And also detached cranial part of origam flavor. And also lateral part of origam flavor, detached. Dissection of origam flavor from the dura. And uh, we can take out, we can take out the flower with a one piece. It takes only 80 minutes. I'll show you again how to detach the ligand flavor. After really, after finishing the reading on the right side, because it in this patient doesn't have compression on left side. I am uh, decompressing only right side with the left side laminotomy. I am doing contralateral approach. After really, detach, first detach the cranial part of origam flower from lamina and uh, detached lateral part of uh, ligand flavor from the SAP. Also detached ligand flavor from low lamina and take it out with the one piece, with the forceps. Yeah, I'm detaching here. This is, uh, I'm detaching lateral part of ligand flavor from SAP. This is the SAP. Yeah. Uh, after removal of ligand flavor, we can see clearly a, a superior articular process. This is a right side superior articular process. And we can confirm the traversing route here. Yeah, with the curette, you can decompress lateral recess. Here is the lateral recess of a right side. I am decompressing right side S1 root with the curette, unroofing, like rotating the curette. Yeah, this is the right side S1 root. I am doing live surgery. And then, because here, uh, SO root is compressed by air, vacuum, and some small part of a hernia disc. So, gentle dissects, I am, oh, sorry. This is a compressed area here. So we have to compress, decompress the SO root. You can find uh, some air bubbles. Uh, so, uh, wait a minute. Look at it. There are some, we can see some bubbles from the disc epidural space.
Can you see? Just before verbal, yeah, air bubbles. Daisy, Daisy came from desiccated disk. I am confirming S1 root. This is S1 root. This is disk. This is disk space over L5 S1. And this, yeah, L, L is take out, push out. It is, that is, yeah. Can you see L bubbles? Yeah, this is L. I show you on CT scan. This is L. It just before you you saw it, the uh, app bubbles. Because the quality of visual is very high on your photo. So we can see easily the bubbles. This, can you see this is S1 root? And we have to also decompress the right L5 root here. With a single laminotomy over left side, we can decompress the right two root, extreme and traversing root. Just before I finish, I complete uh, traversing root, S or root, and I have to decompress right L5 root. Yeah, this is a, this is L five root. Can you see can you see the root? You can see clearly sometime later. This is a, this is L five right L five root. This is S one right S one root. L five root. Yeah, and this is a disk space. This is a, some important picture for uh, Xiam. I have, I'm getting Xiams for where, where am I? Lateral, extraflamular, nearly extraflamular area. I'm checking Xiams uh, with the sorry. So we on Xiam you can see where, where we are, or laterally, extra from area, and posteriorly here. Okay, so my conclusion is uh, that with, with the dual photo, you can see the uh, all the poke, all the poke very clearly, and uh, the independent between endoscope, endoscope and the instrument, we can independence. So we can have a, a, a decompression surgery very easily, very handy. Actually, I have. A, uh, uh, uniform surgeon for over the 20 years and uh, over the 5,000 of cases I have for uniform. But from 2060, I started bipolar. So in, in my case, all of the spinal canal stenosis surgery is done by bipolar. And for the herniated disc, usually I remove herniated disc with a transforamina uniform approach. So my conclusion is, uh, for the hernia disc, uniform is minimal in this. Uniform transparameter approach is the uh, best. Because uniform transparameter approach, you can get on the local anesthesia, and the no laminotomy, no ligand problem, removal, and no patectectomy. Only removal with the uniform. So removal of hernia disc, the best of choice is uniform. But in the case of spinal canal stenosis, there is a lot of bones to remove. So, in the case of uh, in the case of uh, so removal 
large amount of bone, bipolar is uh, much more better. It is my conclusion. Thank you for thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Chairman. My name is Dong Ho. I came from Seoul, South Korea. Well, thank you for invitations. I especially thanks to the uh, Professor Yong Kim and the all staff. So uh, today's my topic is the duopolar and the screen by interval fusions, in especially the tulip. So I want to show my technique of the duopolar and the tulip like this. So many doctors, uh, especially spine doctors, said to me. The endoscopic surgery is all uh, incomplete surgeries or limited surgery. There are high possibility of the incomplete decompression or fusion failure. It, however, I want to show that it is uh, untrue. So the concern is of the duoprotal endoscopic surgery, including TULI, uh, incomplete uh, possibility of the incomplete surgery or limited surgery. However, after this lecture, that is uh, untrue. So the advantage of the duoprotal uh, tulip, firstly, we can do direct decompression of the central canal, like uh, open surgery or MIS tulip. This is ipsilateral linear uh, traversion of the central canal. And also we can decompress contralateral uh, traversion of the tulip. Sometimes I decompress the axing of the tulip. You can see the uh, insertion of the KG. Also, we can uh, achieve indirect decompression as well as uh, direct decompression. We can treat the life size of the cage into the disk space. The widening of the disk space, you can see the uh, indirect decompression, widening of the foramen after a bipolar endoscopy tulip. And third ad advantage is the endoscopic endoclipation. Uh, most of the only board lip, the endoclip preparations, is a uh, uh, blind procedure just to see the see on fluoroscope. However, we can see the end plate preparations, high resolution magnified endoscope view. We can separate cartilage end plate from the osseous end plate without any injury. This is cartilage end plate, and this is osseous end plate. The uh, less of two features. The final view of the complete end plate preparations under the CR endoscopic view. Sometimes I see the anterior annular annulus and ALL, a very safe procedure. So without uh, we can do complete end plate, end plate preparations without any injury of the osseous end plate. This effect we can prevent the subsidence of KG. Finally, we can enhance and accelerate of the intervertebral diffusions like this. That is a very uh, nice advantage of the endoscopic intervertebral diffusions. So we can minimize the traumatization of the muscles. And I want to do painless surgery. The combination of the ERAS pathway, there are so big synergy effect of the endoscopic spine surgery. Basically, this technique of the duopolar tulip is very similar to the MIS tulip using the tubular retractors. So firstly, I did the unilateral laminotomy and facetectomy, and then did the annular incision and discectomy and endoplate preparations. Finally, I put in the cage into the disc space. Very same, same. However, we can reduce post-operative pain, post-operative complications, so I want to show my 
a bit my case and video. This female patient presented with the claudications and post leg pain. You can see the spondylolisthesis and uh, central canal stenosis. So my decision is the dual portal endoscopy tulip. Right side did the right side approach it. Anat anatomical orientation is here. Firstly, I expose ipsilateral lamina, right side, and ipsilateral facet, and then the, the ipsilateral lamina to me like this. And can, you can see the ligand flavum. I expose the proximal ligand, uh, end of the ligand flavum, and I did the ipsilateral facet to me. Especially, I remove the inferior articular process. This process process very similar to the MIS study, and I did the laminotomy at the superior portion of the lower lamina. I exposed the, of the ipsilateral ligament flavum proximal to this end, and the removal of the ipsilateral ligament flavum here. You can see the dura and adhesion around the dura. Also, I did a removal of the lamina of the ligament flavum. And then I tilt my scope Contralaterally, I did now I did removal of the contralateral side of the ligament flavum. After removal of the ligament contralateral side of the ligament flavum, we can completely decompress central canal as well as contralateral traversal of the two, L5 number two. I, I usually do complete, uh, complete uh, central canal decompressions using the curettes and light size of the keris lonjo. And I did the uh, annular incision and removal of the disc materials. And end plate preparations uh, was achieved by shaver. And I separated cartilage end plate from the osseous end plate here and removal of the only cartilage end plate under the uh, high vision so mag magnified endoscopy view. Contra arterial side and the preparations are taken by the angled curates. And you can see it. And Dura was literated medially. And I put in the uh, cage into this space, obliquely inserted cage, more deeply in inserted. That is final view of the endoscopic integral diffusions. And then I put in the percutaneous pedicle screw under the CM guidance. And after you can see the complete reduction of the spondylar recesses. And the followed the post operative MRI reveal the complete reduction of the end, uh, spondylar recess. Also, central canal was completely uh, decompressed. And then recently, I did the modified dual portal endoscopy tulip using the large space. I used the, this cage. This cage size is uh, smaller than the olive or the cage or larger than the flip or flip cage. You can see the, the insertion states of the large size cage into the disc space. So, if we did the unilateral lamina to me and total facet to me, including IAP and SAP, we can make enough space for the insertion of the life size KG. So, firstly, the life size of the cage was inserted obliquely. I did deposit deeply inserted transversely like this. So, I will show also my modified technique. This patient presented with both leg pain with uh, intermittent crowd patients. You can see their spondylolisthesis with their central canal stenosis at the alpha 5 level. Left side approaches. First, I make into portal. And also, I expose ipsilateral lamina and facet. Very similar to the MIS clip. I did the ipsilateral laminotomy for the lower portion of the L4. I did the uh, Laminotomy, but the collected bone chips was used for the interbody diffusion material. Now I exposed the proximal end of the ligand flavum, and then I did the ipsilateral pastectomy, the removal of the inferior articular process using the micro osteotome. 
this procedure, maybe you, <laughs> you usually do using the chip law lit vector. Finally, expose of the superior process. I did the superior laminar tomy using the just kerosene punches. Sometimes I use the rotated coarse, coarse punches and complete removal of the ipsilateral ligand flavum. And you can see the giraffe. The bleeding just uh, was occurred epidural vein, easily controlled by the RF. And then ipsilateral central canal was completely decompressed. I just tilting of the my scope, you can see the contralateral side ligand flavum, the sublaminar dissection, and I dissect between the dura and uh, ligand flavum. We can easily decompress contralateral side like this. After removal of the contralateral side ligand flavum, we can decompress ipsilateral and contralateral transverse nobles as well as uh, central canal. Also, finally, I did the uh, superior portion of the SAP remover and anulotomy and discectomy. Basically, these procedures were very similar to the MI slip. I just used the shaver from the Medtronics or various company. Now I did the separations, cartilage and plate from the osseous end plate. and the removal of the cartilage end plate only without any injury of the osseous end plate. And this point is very uh, nice advantage of the dual portal to lead. And contralateral side end plate preparations were performed by the angled curate. Yes, I put in the angled curate. We can use every uh, instrument as well as a specialized instrument through the working portal, the final view of the end plate preparations. And I did the additional end plate preparations using the curate. The dura was retracted by the uh, dura retractor and the specialized, uh, customized uh, cage guidance or was inserted the disk space and print the light size of cage into the disk space. Firstly, I put in the uh, cage just obliquely and I depose it. I uh, deeply inserted the transverse like this. So post-operative MRI show, uh, X-ray show, so a life-size cage was inserted at the alpha 5 level. So I want to show this technique. We can safely insert without any injury of the dura, the over-retraction of the dura. I will check the size of the cage using the cage trier. Estimate the cage. The dura was retracted by the specialized dura retractor and turned the customized cage guidance into the disk space. You can see the dura here. And finally, I insert a life size cage into the space. No evidence uh, of the over distraction of the dura and traversal of the two during the cage insertions. And then obliquely inserted, cage was uh, more deeply inserted transversely using the cage impact. <clears throat> so I want to show the CM view. First, I put in the cage uh, dual retractor, like here. Dual was retracted it, and cage guidance was inserted in disk space and put in the cage under the CM guidance, obliquely inserted cage was more deeply inserted by uh, transpose like here. So I just want to show my cases. This the male, uh, male patient, uh, you can see the uh, ischemic spondylitis is the L5S1. My plan is the dual portal clip after surgery. 
the uh, the spawn recesses was completely without him. After surgery, you can see there the foramen stenosis of the S5S1 was widening, um, indirect decompression. Also, you can see the size of the cage. We can safely insert a life size cage into the interbody space. So these patients also severe back pain with the complications. You can see the double lysis, uh, L45, L5 S level, like recesses. So my plan is the duoporal tulip. Also, you can see the life size case was inserted at the L45, L5 S1 level. So there are many evidences, uh, including the meta analysis and the systemic review. Also, I published one uh, paper of the meta-analysis of the endoscopy tulip. So fusion late, uh, I followed one year, post-operative two year. I collect my cases using the CT scan. Uh, in personal experience, very similar to the MI tulip, or uh, my personal experience more than 95%. So, conclusions, the advantage of the dual portal clip, we can achieve direct decompressions like microsurgery. Also, we can do clear, complete end preparations under the magnified high resolution uh, endoscopy view. We can put in the various sides of the cage into the space, into the disc space, and the combination of the ER specifics, there are a good synergy effect of the endoscopic surgery. However, technically unfamiliar and a little difficult. So before start of the endoscopic clip, we need a uh, large experience of the endoscopic surgery as well as MIS, microsurgery MIS clip. So we always welcome, please visit. If you have a time, please visit. I am Dr. Barks Hospital. We can help you. So this is my profile. You can scan QR code. You can see the my profile and CV. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Chang from now. I work in Lewis Memory Hospital in Suwon, South Korea. And today, is, my topic is the how to avoid uh, interoperative complications with your portal endoscope. This is my disclosure. Uh, left side show the microscope dissector, and right side show the dual portal endoscope. You can see the clean image and magnified view in the right side. So this is dual portal endoscope, I see. So there are so many uh, advantages in dual portal surgery. Uh, your portal can serve clean images through the continuous irrigation and breathing control by hydrostatic pressures. And endoscopic lens located within the body, so magnified view also obtained during the surgeries. So moreover, the surgical method and anatomy are very similar to microscopic surgery, so learning curve is not steep in spine surgery. And it also has some minimal invasive spine techniques. But sometimes various uh, complications also develop during the surgery. So uh, to achieve the favorable outcome, so main surgeon 
should know about uh, interoperative complications. As this slide, many kinds of complications will be occurred during the surgery. And most common is, I think, the duratia during the surgery. The incidence uh, reported about uh, 8.6% in endoscopic surgery, and duratia in the surgery is similar to uh, this percent. So after duratia, it improves the ICP and sometimes in complete surgery, and also due to the elevated uh, intracranial pressure, so it is related with the unconsciousness after surgery or seizure, so its management and avoidance is very important to perform during the uh, your potential surgery, I see. Uh, Doctor Hoss me uh, provided me about the risk factors of dual potential during the surgery. So surgeons should consider these mentioned factors during the dual potential surgery to reduce the intended uh, duratious arthritis. So I showed us some um, video presentations. So this is. A case in punchy left side and right side you can see the during the removal of bone where the peridural structures without the previous dissection can make the direct here left side as the left side video and some top use of the punchy like right side video you can make the some direct here and sometimes the terrible urethic injury so gentle use of the case and punch is very important to perform the uh, UV surgery and also microscope is also important too. A left side video shows the uh, dual folding. So during the removal of the ligand problem, you can see the dual folding like this. So some beginners are confused to this dual folding to become the problem. So he removed this area and make the right side of dual, uh, pump dual injury. So uh, it is, you can see that this dual folding and it's know the very important too. And right side video shows the revision surgery and some rough tie section of the lateral side. This is our junior's case. He can make the right detector of uh, injury like this. So during the revision surgery, clear margin, to, to find the clear margin is very important to perform the dual uh, portal surgeries. And this is terrible situation. After the removal of ligament problem, additional bone was performed using the endoscopy and you can find the terrible situation like this. Sometimes the root is also injured in this situation. So after the removal of the ligament problem, it is gently used as possible well as the raw speed. And I did not use the endoscopy drill after removal of the foray of the ligament problem. This is not my case. <laughs> 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 and some peridural structure is you should know the uh, this slide is also provide me at the hall and left side uh, showed the posterior epidural ligament and it located between the ventral part of the ligament problem and those are part of dura like this so rough dissection of what the limb with the, this ligament can make the dura here and right side, they show some ligament structure. Sometimes we, uh, it's called the uh, Hopman ligament, and sometimes it, it remove what the dissection is needed to retract the dura or under root medial. So, uh, a lot of dissection or removal of this ligament can make the ventral side of dura injury, and uh, we meet uh, some unrecognized CSF leakage after the surgery. So you shouldn't know about the, this ligament. Uh, left side showed the peridural membrane, and uh, I'd like to remove the peridural membrane of the dura 
and it, after the removal of the peridial membrane, we can find the clear margin of GRI. It is also important to reduce the GRI injury. And right side video shows the peridural adhesion. So sharp dissection is very important to meet the true GRI margin. And after the dissection of the adhesion, and I remove the, this adhesion tissue, and we can find the true dry margin, and then we can perform the success of this tummy or the decompressions. And its main treatment is also sometimes simple. That they, most of this is uh, is controlled by the fibrin patchy, and sometimes, but a conversion to microsurgery is required. But in most of cases, uh, we can control the using the fibrin fibrin patchy. So the dry, after the dry tear, we can manage it with the fibrin patchy or sometimes direct suture or recess creep. But sometimes you should consider the conversion to my open microscopy surgeries. And this is direct suture, very difficult and with the wrong time. So I did not use this technique and you can see the suture of the dura and right side show the making the knot but this technique is very important and we uh, need the wrong time so i did not use this technique this is also dr Hoss video and direct here is a quad like this and fibrin patch sealing and it's like this to packing and sealing is very effective method in um, small size of right here, I think. This case is also Dr. Saad Kuran video. We show the right side jewel depict here and picking the some gel foam and two ray of jura in the side the grasp the this pose and then which has clearly supplied like this, and I think this is very effective method to control the threat here. And sometimes the direct nerve injury is also occurred with the, after the dry injury or the uh, heat damage by radio frequency and some excessive retraction of nerve root. But uh, already I mentioned that some punch or arterial like this. So, Right side uh, with, uh, picture shows the cervical nerve root injury. He is an um, experienced surgeon to do surgery, but he confused the ventral motor branch to disc material. So this terrible situation is also occurred during the surgery. And left side video shows the three injury. He is our junior surgeon. He, after the number of the ligament problem, he using the drill roughly like this, and he can he made the nerve root injury like this. So, after the number of the ligament problem, I do not use the uh, endoscopic drill during the surgery as part of rest. So this is simple technical tip. During the decompression procedure, I performed the bone work using the endoscopic drill like this, and then remove the outer ray of ligament problem and complete the bone up at, after the complete bone up. And then I, pop, I remove the full ray of the ligament problem like this under the clean operative images. To uh, maintain the clean image, the outflow is well maintained during the surgeries. And control arterial side decompression like this. Sometimes I use the small oscillatome to decompression the lateral recess of the uh, lateral recess like this. Sometimes the breathing from the exposed cancerous bone, so 
this situation, I use the phono ceiling to the exposed uh, cancerous phone like this. And sometimes the unrecognized breathing is occurred during the surgery. Um, many kind of method is uh, effective, but I use the approach like this and then weighty irrigation. You can see the breathing control is achieved like this. So this is very effective to control the um, breathing control during the surgery. And already I mentioned the, to obtain the clean image during the surgery, uh, outflow maintenance is very important. So left side showed the outflow maintenance is well made. And if the outflow is not well made, we use the this semi tubular tube insert the working space and then opera is well maintained you can see the um, green image of the operative image like this so uh, opera maintenance is very important to achieve the uh, good uh, operation procedures and sometimes wrong level surgery is also occurred especially in cervical spine in patient with high productivity. This patient showed the right side prominent discoordination like this, but he performed the cervical posture prominent and you can see the dry area and root area here. And we find the rupture discrement here, but he cannot find the rupture discrement. Mm -hmm. So we check then he knew the long level surgery and then he performed the upper level posterior cervical primary tummy and he can find the rupture discrement like this. So uh, especially in cervical spine, but sometimes the hyperodotic lumbar spine, uh, you should check the CM image during the surgery to reduce the, wrong, the possibility of the wrong level surgery. Sometimes the excessive facial injury is occurred during the surgery. So this is my fellow uh, done the laminectomy. He, he did not find the exact the spinolaminar junction. He initiated drilling the lateral side of the spinolaminar junction and uh, he removed the most part of the anti-articular process and he called me. The, he, uh, I go to the operating room, IAP was gone. <laughs> so, and then I tried to find the midline structure. So uh, to reduce the passive joint limber, uh, to try to find the midline fissure of the ligand problem is very important. And then I find the midline fissure and leave the uh, total decompression of the spinal canal So passive joint to, Preserve the passive joint, the contralateral approach is very effective. So, this is the down migration discoordination left side. We can, uh, we can, um, could remove the successfully the disc fragment like this, and passive joint injury uh, is not uh, observed with this post operative MRI scans. Sometimes the approach selection is also very important. L45 or migrated discoordination like this, and some is located within the intervertebral foramen. This is also our junior's case. He performed the right side laminectomy, nearly hemilaminectomy, and he removed the, some disc foramen like this. But post operative MRI shows the incomplete removal of the disc foramen disc fragment like this and second surgery is required in these cases so in this situation control lateral approach is very uh, useful method so this uh, migrated discarnation you can find the successful removal of the uh, migration and the permanent discarnation like this this is video finding 
right side approach and control other side. This is left side approach. And after the control other side, the sublime now approach and we can find the rupture of this crement like this. And we can easily remove the rupture of this crement like this. Sometimes the paraspinal approach is also performed. Uh, this patient is also primary discrimination. And at the time I performed the uh, paraspinal approach, mm -hmm. and you can find the exposed uh, SAT after the removal of the SAT right this. And the paraspinal ligament is also removed like this, and we can find the Exiting of it here, and we can find the rupture discrement here, and we successfully removed the uh, um, migrated the primary discrimination like this. We can find the decompressed in the root and medial side of dura is also uh, so this area. So to to uh, reduce the incomplete limb by the we applied the various surgical approach to lumbar discarnation or the lumbar spinal stenosis, I think. This is my summary today. Uh, dual portal is, I think, the excellent surgical tool, but sometimes complication is also can be occurred. So uh, this is um, uh, main advantages of the dual portal. I think the clean image and magnetic view during the surgery. So. Our flow maintenance is very important to, to achieve the successful uh, surgical procedure. And uh, as far as the ligament problem, it should be preserved during the uh, endoscopic drilling, I think. The surgeon should know the peridural ligament or the uh, peridural structure membrane. And surgeons should uh, apply the various approach to achieve the successful uh, clinical outcome, I think. Thank you. So uh, while we're setting up for Dr. Dan Park's uh, video uh, lecture, uh, I want to take a couple of minutes to take some questions. I'm sure you know maybe some of the points weren't ma well made or weren't clear because of the microphone issues and whatnot. Those of you in the audience may have some questions. One of the questions that were asked uh, were, uh, there was a video clip showing the interbody device going in and there was a retraction, uh, nerve retractor in the field. And one of the questions were, where is that nerve retractor going through? Is that work going through the working portal, uh, working portal or is it through the camera portal? Is it a separate portal? It is done through the working portal. The portal is big enough. It's like, you know, sticking a pen fill four, right? So you so stick something in there, you retract, you still have enough room to get your kerosene or whatever the cage that you need to and put it in. So it is truly, uh, you could have coupler instruments within that portal. Um, are there any other questions or, well, yes? So, okay. So when you, you go visit the surgeons in Korea, most of them will use zero degree scope, but I have seen, um, I think it was Dr. Park who used a 30 degree scope to really show you how well that this space is prepared. Because zero degree scope will not be able to show you the control out of space. Whereas you change out the scope and put the 30 degree scope in there, you really see the other side and you can see the anterior, even like annulus on the control out of side. But I, you know, we, my hospital does not have a zero degree scope. We only have a, like a huge endoscope for zero degree. So I did uh, try my first three cases with 30 degree scope. It is a little bit more challenging for sure. Um, yeah. And one other point that I think, you know, all the surgeons wanted to make clear was the, the biggest challenge is getting disoriented, right? You go in there, you feel the view is small, it's smaller than the tube case. So you could get lost easily. So the first thing, the emphasis is finding the spinal laminar line, which can be easily done. And you can confirm that if you're not sure what the fluoroscopy. And the second thing, once you start drilling, drilling up and staying medial, 
is what Dr. Park has mentioned many times, and Dr. Zhang and Dr. Hood mentioned is finding the head of the butterfly. They in Korea they like to refer the the whole shape of the ligament problem as the shape of butterfly, right? You got the head and you got the wings coming up and then the tail is going down. The head is the most distal attachment of the proximal part. And then you got the wings that go into the frame, right? So even in open surgery, right? How do we know how far we've gone up? We go up right to where we see the fat, the stop, and then we go laterally, right? Exactly the same thing. That is your key to finding out how proximal you've gone, where you are with respect to median lateral. And then from there on, you could go lateral to that, then you go into control lateral space, and you come medial to it, and then you come coming to your side. Easy said than done, but that is how you orient yourself. Yes, sir. As far as orientation goes, I think the other thing that helps you stuff is make sure, you know, we're always showing you, you're envisioning yourself at the tip of the camera. Just take a step back and look at your hands and look at where the scope is. So the scope's the 30 degree is, if you're using a 30 degree scope, is always oriented exactly 180 degrees from where the sort of pistol grip is. And so if you look down and you see the patient is oriented this way and your hand is a little bit this way, your hand is a little sort of pronate or supinate or however you want to think about it, you know, that means you're a little disoriented. And, and your drill, your burp tip is always going to go left to right. And so if your camera is oriented this way, you're going to be drilling this way. Or if it's this way, you're going to be drilling slightly that way. And then um, to the to, to Young's point about once you find the cranial margin of the ligamentum, you'll see that midline rapé. And you're going to know how well or how, how good of a job you did at orienting yourself because that midline rapé should basically go straight across your screen. It should be basically <laughs> parallel to the floor, right? So you think about it. When we're working under the microscope, you know, or even with loops, that's how you're always oriented. So you have the advantage of just sort of body position. Here you're adding one more articulation, right, by kind of rotating your hand. And you're usually so, like, obsessed about what you're seeing on the screen, you know, we forget to just look down at our, at our own hands. It was a tough lesson because I was working with my fellow under the microscope, and he stabbed me with an 11 blade. And I was like... What are you doing, man? Like he literally stuck it in my finger, and you know I realized you know he's so focused on the scope, he he, he hands a knife and just goes like this, he sticks it in the wound. I realized, ah, like you know we forget that you can actually take your head out of the scope, right? You can actually look at your own hand. Uh, he he never recovered from that. Uh, <laughs> I think he's a pediatric resident now. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, I, I think just as a point, when you're doing this operation, you know, you're so focused, it's a new skill set, you're learning all this other stuff, but, you know, just take a second, just kind of step back and look at your hands again, right? Just see where you're, you're you know, just kind of like, you know, golf swing or tennis swing, everything. It's about your base and where your hands are. Is the uh, lecture ready to play? One more question. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. Hello, my name is Don Park, and I'm from UCLA. Today I'll be talking about the marriage of dual portal spinal endoscopy and dual XT lift, also known as amplified dual lift. Sorry that I wasn't able to make the symposium in person and had to give this uh, talk uh, virtually. I hope that it's a great day uh, for everybody um, and uh, they're learning a whole lot about dual portal endoscopy. These are my disclosures. So dual portal spinal endoscopy is when you have two separate uh, portals, one for the endoscopic viewing portal and another for the working portal. And it truly decouples the endoscopic camera from the surgical instruments and differentiates it from the uniportal technique. This allows for greater flexibility, better visualization, since it is uh, endoscopic, as well as uh, you know, increased versatility, since you're no longer uh, just uh, uh, limited to the trajectory of the endoscopic trocar. It's a familiar approach and territory, as uh, I'll talk about further. It's the same surgery with the same instruments. It's just a different visualization tool. Whether you use uh, loops or microscopic uh, uh, techniques to perform surgery and specialized retractors, you know, it's the same surgery that you're doing when you get to the anatomy. And the same goes for dual portal. 
And so we're just using an endoscope to visualize uh, the anatomy and to affect it. There are challenges with the endoscopic tea lift um, uh, that uh, are more due to the limitations of the uniportal technique. The transcamden uh, far lateral extra foraminal technique uh, does have limitations because uh, the, uh, you can injure the exiting nerve root. You can have quadriceps palsy, radiculitis, and that's been described in the literature. And there's a question of uh, fusion. Can you truly get fusion through uh, the devices available? There's limitations in the uh, cage options for the uniportal technique. Since you do need a narrow cage to fit through that approach and to fit through the transforaminal corridor. Uh, 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 and uh, there are uh, reports of uh, end plate resorption that occurs with certain implants um, that could limit fusion. In my mind, the biggest limitation is unfamiliar territory. You know, I don't think that we're traditionally taught to go outside in uh, to uh, get to the disc and, uh, and to do a, a T lift. So because of that, it is a steep learning curve uh, with the endoscopic T lift. The dual portal endoscopic T lift is different. In the, and it was developed in the advanced in South Korea. Dr. Ha and Dr. Park, who are faculty there today, are uh, some of the innovators and masters in this technique. And they taught me everything that I know about the, the endoscopic TILA uh, using the dual portal technique. They showed me large peak cages being placed uh, uh, posterior laterally. These were like, uh, like lateral cages that they were putting in a TILA uh, into the disc space and rotating into position. And that just blew my mind in terms of what you can do with this technique. It's more familiar. You know, you, you're seeing the, the anatomy just like you would, uh, and the steps are uh, similar to MIST lift. Then with expandable devices, there are challenges as well. You know, there's a risk of subsidence that's uh, documented in the literature. It's difficult to revise or re reposition certain implants. It can collapse postoperatively, which, uh, uh, which has been seen in the past. And there's minimal volume in terms of uh, bone graft that can be placed after expansion with certain implants. And the subsidence and collapse is something that's been well documented in the literature. And so this is something that is concerning. Uh, and the dual X design is really to help reduce that risk of subsidence and collapse. You have a really wide expansion and large footprint of the cage that helps minimize its subsidence. It's easy to reverse and reposition, and you can place a lot of bone graft through that cage through the open architecture of the cage. And with two independent locking mechanisms, you can have good stability um, that you can count on so it doesn't collapse again in, uh, after surgery. So you have uh, uh, an implant that goes in a collapsed smaller state of 12 millimeters width that can expand all the way to 21 millimeters and then in, in, and expand in height by three millimeters. And it's the only implant that allows that bi-directional uh, 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 expansion that is titanium. And this is something that uh, uh, is uh, truly a differentiator uh, in the market. And when I first saw this cage, I, I uh, was certain this was something that can be done endoscopically, given uh, that it's placed small. And you can see that uh, uh, it has such a, a large uh, expansion that occurs. The uh, stability is occurring through a dual locking mechanism. There's a uh, expansion locking mechanism and an active secondary screw lockout. And this ensures that the cage is uh, completely expanded and stays that way. Um, it's only one of two non-screw based expansion mechanisms uh, with the uh, first expansion locking mechanism. And in terms of placing the bone graft, you can place a lot of bone graft through the open architecture of the cage. Um, after expansion, and you can fill that, that disk space and go beyond the, uh, the contours of the cage itself. <clears throat> and truly, it is market uh, uh, leading and differentiating as compared to the other expandable uh, cages out there on the market. The uh, elegance of this uh, uh, implant is the inserter. The inserter is truly uh, a marvel in that it is something that you can just uh, 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 pick up right away because it's so easy. The inserter can help you with the insertion and placement of the cage. You, you turn the inserter uh, clockwise to laterally expand the cage and keep turning it to uh, get the vertical expansion. 
And then once you have uh, complete the expansion, then you can use the inserter to uh, place bone graft into the cage as well as placing the, the final uh, bottom screw. In terms of clinical benefits and safety, this is uh, uh, pretty low uh, complication rate with only two adverse events reported to the FDA and less than a 0.2% adverse event rate, which is quite low compared to what's expected by the FDA for new technologies. And this is with 1600 plus levels treated. And we are undergoing clinical studies at, the time, at this time uh, to prove its clinical effectiveness and safety. And so this is uh, some cases that I have. Uh, so a case of L45 uh, grade one spondylolisthesis with uh, uh, instability with flexion and extension. And you can see severe stenosis uh, at the L45 level. So this is a pretty straightforward common uh, case that you see uh, in clinic every day. And so uh, we start with the unilateral laminotomy, bilateral decompression that you should uh, learn today at the symposium. And then you do the facetectomy. And you can see the osteotome uh, uh, performing the facetectomy. I can visualize that, that, that osteotome using the endoscope and see that I'm safe. I'm not going to be injuring the dura uh, with that osteotome. Then you expose Camden's triangle. You place the cage. It's really the same steps as an MIFT, but I'm just using the endoscope to visualize. And the thing that really uh, differentiates this technique uh, versus all uh, other T-lift techniques, MIS or open, is being able to place that camera into the disc space and then place an instrument to then uh, help perform the discectomy. And you can see here that I'm, I'm removing the disc material and I can have bony uh, bleeding uh, uh, end plates after removing the cartilage. What I usually do is I place a shaver and I'll sequentially shave the disc uh, space um, and then use pituitaries and curettes uh, to then remove the disc, just like I would with an MIS telo. And then I'll place the, the endoscope into the disc space and I realize, wow, there's so much more that needs to come out. I'm not doing a good job. And there's studies that uh, definitely demonstrate that we're really not good at doing a discectomy on, with a telo. But this allows us to then visualize you know, the uh, uh, the complete discectomy as well as preparation end plate, and this allows for successful fusion. It's not just the cage, it's not just the bone graft, but it's the technique itself that allows us to then uh, be able to get solid fusion. And I think putting that all together only optimizes our chances. And so uh, this is a video of me uh, visualizing the discectomy and taking lots of pictures and videos so I can show it to you today. And then I'm placing the cage. Uh, you can see that I have the, the dura uh, retracted and I have specialized sled retractors to help in place the, uh, the cage into position. And I'll impact it into position. My uh, resident is uh, holding the endoscope and uh, helping me to maintain that visualization so I don't injure the dura. And this is the uh, intraoperative uh, video of the cage going in. You can see the sled and that helps protect uh, the exiting nerve root, and then the nerve root retractor is helping to protect the uh, fecal sac. And then uh, the, uh, uh, the sled also helps to insert the uh, cage in easily. And then once you get the cage into final position, then you expand, and then literally you're just rotating the, uh, the uh, expander hot clockwise to get it to uh, get its final uh, medial to lateral expansion. And then you continue clockwise uh, rotation to get the vertical expansion. So really it's uh, uh, quite a simple, elegant design. And then you uh, use the same inserter to then uh, uh, find your trajectory of the lock and screw and then place your final lock and screw for uh, uh, the uh, final locking uh, mechanism. And I, again, I'm doing this under direct visualization with the endoscope um, and uh, uh, being able to visualize everything clearly. And here I'm placing the allograft so I can see the dura, I can see the cage in its final position after expansion, after removal of the inserter. And you can either use the inserter or the specialized uh, cannulas that can then uh, place uh, bone grafts. What I like to use is BBM fiber, and then I can place the fiber uh, into the disc space through the cage and be able to then uh, fill up the uh, uh, disc space. I also take the uh, the bone from the facetectomy and 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 I'll uh, process it uh, and use it as autograph and place it into the disc space prior to the, uh, the cage placement. And then I'll place the DBM fiber uh, uh, after that. So here's a fluoroscopic image with the uh, initial uh, dual portal uh, placements. 
and then after the laminotomy, bilateral decompression, then uh, and vasectomy uh, with uh, the discectomy already performed. I'm, I'm then placing the cage into position. I then place the cage into uh, the ventral aspect of the disc space. And then uh, once I've making, made sure that I'm across the midline, then I'll expand medial to laterally. And you can see here this final expansion where you have both medial to lateral and vertical expansion in its final position and is directly uh, uh, in the disc space with excellent reconstruction in that disc space in terms of height uh, and then also in terms of lordosis. And this is the final construct. And you can see that uh, uh, this patient had osteopenia, so I used fenestrated screws and cement augmentation to optimize the fixation. Um, and uh, uh, the final construct and result is excellent as compared to the preoperative state. This is another case of mine where it was a very collapsed L45 grade one spondylolisthesis uh, with severe stenosis and a lot of foraminal stenosis. And what I did here, because of the significant collapse, is I placed a, a pedicle screw uh, retractor on the contralateral side and then did my dual portal uh, uh, laminotomy, bilateral decompression, and facetectomy. Then I then uh, uh, accessed the disc space and used sequential dilators and then held that distraction with the pedicle screw uh, retractor. And so that way I can maintain the distraction uh, and, and the, be able to place the uh, cage and then uh, place the cage into its final position using the endoscope. And then uh, and this is the final construct. And you can see pretty significant height restoration uh, and restoration of the lordosis. This is my final case and it's a recent case of mine. And uh, I uh, uh, performed uh, uh, a two level uh, uh, fusion and I, uh, you can see the L45 uh, grade almost two uh, uh, spondylolisthesis that is unstable. And there is a slight uh, spondylolisthesis at L34 as well with flexion <clears throat> that reduces with uh, extension a bit. And I was worried that uh, this would again get worse and I wanted to treat the L34 level as well. Here's the MRI. You can see that there's uh, mild to moderate stenosis at L34 that I wanted to then treat uh, indirect decompression. Uh, and, but uh, the L45 level treat that with direct decompression since it is pretty severe uh, stenosis. And then uh, you can, uh, so here's an intraoperative image. Uh, I performed the prone lateral uh, at the L34 level. Um, and uh, the, the patient was a single position in the prone position the entire time. And that way I can then perform my uh, dual portal uh, laminotomy, bilateral decompression, and then uh, do the T lift and place the cage into uh, 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 a uh, optimal position using the endoscopic technique. And then this is the final uh, uh, construct using uh, percutaneous pedicle screws. And I was able to then successfully treat LP4 and L45 through very minimally invasive techniques. So this is a uh, study uh, looking at dual lift, um, comparing it to open flip uh, with one year follow up. And the surgical time was found to be longer with dual lift as compared to open, but there were more uh, transfusions reflecting more blood loss in the open as compared to none in the dual lift. There were no difference in complication of fusion rates. And both groups did significant improvements uh, at one year as compared to pre-op. Uh, with the dual portal technique, however, there was less back pain uh, early at one week um, and better improvement of disability outcomes overall with dual portal technique as compared to open, which makes sense because of the uh, uh, open technique. But that's open and PLIF. What about with MIST lift? So let's compare apples to apples here. And so MIST lift versus dual lift with at least one year follow up, we found that the VAS scores and ODI scores were significantly improved after surgery in both groups. And the, the VAS uh, back and SF36 at one month post op was significantly improved more so in the dual lift as compared to MIST lift. There's no difference in terms of VAS, ODI, SF36 between the groups at six months and at one year. And there was no difference in terms of fusion rates, segmental height, and lordosis. So this means that this is uh, uh, equivalent in terms of radiographic results as well as clinical results with some improvement early on. And there's no difference in postoperative uh, complications. So this is safe and effective. And one of the authors, Dr. Ha, uh, 
uh, was one of the, the uh, innovators in this technique, and he can tell you more about uh, the development of the technique um, as well as the uh, long-term clinical results. Dr. Ha also did a meta-analysis of endoscopic fusion and found that uh, there was significant improvement in pain and disability outcomes. The hospital stay was shorter with endoscopic fusion as compared to MIS, and the complication rates were low, one to 5% with dual lift, and the fusion rates were high, up to 95%, depending on how you look at it. And so uh, dual lift is a completely endoscopic T-lift that does not compromise decompression for stenosis. And even for pinpoint severe, severe stenosis, you can still uh, take care of that through the interlaminar approach using the dual portal technique. But once you've done that, then you then take it to the next level, take the facets off, find uh, uh, the disc face, the annulus, then prepare the disc, and then you can then uh, 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 place the uh, a cage with a large footprint um, that, with the dual X uh, cage, and then uh, uh, perform fusion. And I think that by completely removing the disc and the disc space using endoscopic uh, visualization um, and uh, verifying that you have bleeding bone uh, within the end plates, then you're going to optimize your chances of fusion. Again, it's not just the cage, it's not just the bone graft. But it's the, all of the above. It's the technique as well. So this is a game-changing technology matched with game-changing technique. And now I perform dual lift uh, uh, routinely uh, for my T-lifts instead of uh, MIS T-lifts. And I prefer it tremendously because of the uh, uh, advantages that I can have uh, with this uh, technology and technique. Thank you very much. Just use the arrow keys. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I think everything should be good. Terrific. Okay. I'm all set. All right. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Vincent Guarino. I'm here from Serapedics. I'd like to start by thanking David Zuckley and Andy Choi for including Serapedics in today's didactic portion of your conference. Um, we've talked about surgical technique, we've talked about hardware, um, and now we're going to change gears a little bit and talk briefly about bone grafting. Serapedics has a product called iFactor P15. Um, it's a cell binding peptide. There are only two class three uh, FDA approved devices in the United States. Everybody knows Infuse, um, and this is iFactor, which is a peptide enhanced product. <laughs> So Cerex has been, been around for a while. Um, the company was created in the 1990s. Um, it was called Ceramed Dental. It was a, uh, a dental bone graft product. Um, it was sold uh, and created Serapedics in uh, the early 2000s. The product is iFactor. Um, there's been over 100,000 cases that it's been used in, surgeries. It received its CE mark in 2008. Um, and it has FDA, PMA approval um, in the United States for an ACDF. Uh, the approval came in 2015. Um, and there has been, like I said, over 100,000 uh, surgeries to date. So the product has been proven to be superior than autograft. Um, it has a long-standing safety profile equivalent to autograft. Uh, it's more cost effective than the other class three device. Um, and it's the only bone graft approved class three for uh, uh, cervical use. So what's attractive about P P15, um, it has a different uh, mechanism of action. It enhances cell migration. Um, 
what's different is it the mechanism of action is haptotaxis, which is a physical reaction compared to infuse, which is chemotaxis, which is a chemical reaction. So what is P15? So there's a chain of very specific 15 uh, amino acids, which creates a peptide, hence the P15. What it does is where you lay your graft material down, it attracts osteoblast, it attaches to osteoblast, and then it activates the osteoblast. So it enhances and accelerates bone forming. What's different in infuse, infuse is a chemical. So the bone morphogenic protein leaches out into tissue. It convinces stem cells to become osteoblasts. And then you could possibly get an inflammatory response or you could bo grow bone in areas that you didn't want to grow bone in. So it's a very different mechanism of action. And he, again, here's some slides that uh, give a little picture on that. So uh, in this slide, there are over 400 graft materials that you can choose from. Um, in the bottom of the period, the red pyramid, the red section, um, these are all stem cell products. There's less than 10 in the market and the FDA does not require any kind of approval process. Uh, it has minimal uh, invasion of human beings touching the product. There's no dono matching. There is no science behind it. There's no cl clinical evidence, and it is a costly product. The class two products, there's over 400,000. Uh, I'm sorry, over 400. <laughs> um, it requires an, uh, a 510K approval, which is just a, a very brief animal study, and it has to prove equivalent to a predicate device. And at the top of the pyramid, there are only two uh, class three devices. It's a very expensive IDE study, and it has to demonstrate that it is safe and it has efficacy on, on humans. So being a class three device, um, it's a drug device combination. The drug being the peptide P15, the device being calcium phosphate, and hydrogel is the carrier. Um, any bone graft that you use that doesn't have any clinical significance, obviously, is expensive. Um, I-Factor can prove efficacy and safety. So in 2018, ISAS did an independent study and classified and created a recommendation of use of all bone graft products. And in that, in the end, um, there, again, there were only two class three devices that have significant IDE human clinical studies and a PMA approval, and that's BMP2 and P15. There are many studies out there. Um, a lot of them are off-label application or outside the United States, um, but this is well published and well studied. So here's the IDE paper um, that was in 2017. Um, it's used for cervical discectomy infusion, one level inside an allograft ring with plate and screws. So the study, the procedure, it's an ACDF. The control arm is a one-to-one -one randomization uh, of an ACDF with P15 versus an ACDF with autograft. Um, there were 319 patients enrolled in 24 clinical sites, both in the United States and Canada. Um, the endpoints were uh, the efficacy, meaning fusion, NDI, neurological outcomes. There were safety, uh, safety profiles at 12 months um, and an extended follow-up at 18, 24, 36, 48, 60, and 72 months. So again, the surgical procedure, an ACDF um, with a discectomy to achieve decompression, the preparation of the disc space for antibody, uh, the investigational arm was the allograft ring with I-factor, the control arm was uh, an allograft ring with autologous bone. Um, there were no specific anterior plates or 
screws. And again, the primary endpoint was at 12 months. The objectives, you want to see if there's bone fusion, uh, see the neurological outcomes, the functional outcomes, and any complication rates. The secondary endpoints at 12 months were a pain at the neck and shoulders and arms, uh, an SF36 standardized scoring system, and they looked at additional outcomes uh, of any comorbidities in the course of time. It should be noted that there were no exclusion criteria. So high-risk patients were included in the study. So smokers, people with diabetes, et cetera, were all included in the study. Uh, to, to have overall success, you have to have show superiority in, in these four categories. Radiological success, NDI success, neurologic su success, and safety success. So at 12 and 24 months, um, I-factor proved to be superior to autograft at 12 months and 24 months in fusions, 12 and 24 months in an NDI, 12 and 24 months in neurologic success, and 12 and 24 months in safety success. The overall success, uh, the overall score, I factor proved to be superior than an autograph. It is not advancing. Here we go. So here's an animation here. You can see on the far left, uh, the pre-op flexion extension. And then they followed up at three, six, and 12 months. And you can see the fusion mass uh, increasing as time goes on. So when you look at ID, when you look at the I factor success rate at 24 months for fusion at 97.3%, and if you compare that to control arms that we used in um, in artificial disc submissions for IDE, it has a much higher fusion rate. If you look at some of the other companies, I don't have to name them, um, but you can see that overall, what they submitted to to the FDA for approval as a control arm compared to what I factors fusion rate is, it's, it's a superior product. So there are parallels and there are differences when you compare the two class three devices. Um, so, the, so the parallels, both the class three, both have submitted very costly and extensive IDE studies. Um, they're both considered advanced biologics because they enhance cell migration, proliferation and differentiation with other bone graft products do not do that. They both have level one clinical trials and PMA approvals, um, and they are both considered autograph replacements. They're not extenders. The differences, the safety profile, IFACTA has no evidence of ectopic bone formation. Everybody knows the power of infuse and how much bone it could grow. Sometimes it grows bone in places that you don't necessarily want it. Uh, a cost effectiveness, I factor is 30 to 50% less expensive than infuse. The active ingredient um, is P15 uh, peptide as compared to a bone morphogenic protein. And the indications, I factor is the only class three device that is approved to be used uh, in ACDF, in cervical spine. Uh, there are many published uh, papers on issues with infuse. Um, there are none with I factor. So the safety and the history, the CE mark was in 2008 for orthopedics and spine use. This is a little dated. There are over 100,000 cases performed at this point in time. There are multiple studies. They're all peer reviewed uh, for different areas in the, in the spine and long bone. Um, I can leave, I will leave some cards on the front desk if anybody would like to see that information. Uh, if you email me, I'll have the medical education department provide you with those studies. So the I factor was approved by uh, the FDA in November of 2015. 
Uh, again, there's been over 100,000 cases, and it's the only ACDF-approved graft. It is not a morphogen. Um, there is no edema or swelling, no ectopic bone formation, no inflammatory response, and it does not act away from the graft. It brings osteoblasts to the graft. Again, there's a major cost savings. What is excellent about this product, uh, it doesn't have to be, um, there is no thawing, reconstitution, mm -hmm. mixing. It has a three-year shelf life. It's ready to go in its syringe. Mm -hmm. You store it at room temperature. Um, and there's no tissue tracking. It's not human tissue. It comes in three sizes, 1 cc, 2.5 cc's, and 5 cc's. And I would like to point out that it is approved in all of the NYU Langone uh, hospitals. It's approved in the entire Northwell system. It's approved at hospital special <laughs> surgery. It's in the endpoint of trial at uh, New York H H H H H HHC. Um, it is at the endpoint of approval in the Montefiore system. It's at the endpoint of approval at Stony Brook and it's at the beginning stages of approval at Mount Sinai. Uh, thank you very much for your time, and I, I enjoyed being here. Thank you. You have the clip on your... You have the, mic, you have the mic clip on your... Uh, I believe yours is on here. All right, um, we'll move on to something different. Um, we've been talking about T lifts for now, um, but we'll thank you for Andy for inviting me here. We're going to switch gears to the lateral um, X lift. Um, dual expansion uh, procedure. Uh, Amplify does have a lateral cage that we have here. Um, so if you guys have time, please uh, look at that. And um, I'll kind of tell you my experience with the lateral expandable cage, as well as some of the benefits of it. Um, basically, um, the lateral approach is just another way to get the inner body fusion. Um, the two common approaches are direct lateral um, as well as um, ATP or OLIF. Um, I personally do not do the OLIF procedure. I think Brian does the OLIF procedure. Um, so you can talk to Brian about that, but uh, this will be specifically related to the lateral, X-lift direct lateral approach. Um, so what are the benefits of the lateral? Um, really, um, you know, the virgin territory, so you don't have to go through the scarring, uh, scar tissue as uh, Dr. Zhang showed some of the going through scar tissue increases your risk for some complications. Compared to anterior, the lateral, uh, you, you minimize the vascular um, injuries, uh, as well as you don't need an access surgeon, um, which is sometimes an ordeal to kind of co-schedule. Um, if you're not doing deformity correction, you can maintain the ALL for stability. 
and compared to posterior, you can put a bigger cage in as well as uh, prevent muscle stripping. Um, and Andy did uh, edit out my picture here, but uh, those are some fat rolls on a lady. Um, so compared to going anterior, it is much easier. Um, so what are the potential complications that um, you can run into? Uh, for ATP, um, since you're moving your corridor slightly anterior, um, there's higher risk for uh, vascular injury, end plate damage, uh, nerve injury, urethral damage, and abdominal injury. And I think just like anything else um, in life, we, we all have our skeletons in our closet. And unfortunately, we don't talk really a lot about our complications. So if you look at this meta-analysis, uh, they did have a complication rate about 32%, which is probably... Um, Overreported because a lot of this is just more end plate subsidence and some um, bony settling um, that we can see. Um, but the the complications that we all worry about vascular nerve injury, it was um, about uh, half, you know, less than half of those complication rates. But I suspect that complication rates for ATP or lateral is a little bit higher than what's reported out in the literature just for um, uh, underreporting of some of our complications. If you look at the trans psoas or the direct lateral, complication rates are very similar. Um, the most fear complication really for us is the transient uh, neurological um, injuries, injuries to the lumbar plexus that we all worry about. But in this uh, study uh, out of Rush, um, it was about 4% for persistent uh, neurovascular compromise. So the main fear is uh, really the uh, lumbar plexus. We did this study when I was a resident at Rush where we put the K-wire in the, in the uh, nuvasive technique, and we found that as you get um, closer down to L4-5, um, there were um, some injuries where the K-wire would pierce directly into the nerve root, so that's the most severe complication. Um, so what are the causes for neurological issues that we worry about? Um, you can have direct trauma, just like this case on that, on that right with that K-wire, if you blindly do that procedure without neuromonitoring. And also it could be indirect, um, which is the most common probably cause and that can be due to retraction, which causes a pressure ischemic injury to the nerve. And um, the question is, is it the duration of retraction or is it the size of the dissection? And we do not know. Um, if you look at time dependence, uh, this study over here looked that there was no correlation with time. Um, they found that there was 27 or 28 minutes for people who did not have um, neurological injury versus 29. So they did not find that, but again, it was only 26 patients. If you look at other studies um, by Juan Uribe out in Arizona, um, he did find a difference in time. Uh, Brendan Bendersky in 107 patients found 20 minutes as their cutoff. Um, and this other study did look at duration of surgery related to hip flexion deficit. So I think um, the lateral societies, Solus and all those uh, places, I think they've kind of quoted 20, 25 minutes as your cutoff for level that you don't wanna take forever to do that procedure. Again, uh, another possibility is this uh, size of the incision. We can imagine that if you use a smaller incision, um, like the picture on the left, that's the uh, K2M striker device where that blade is 22 millimeters. That's probably a different animal compared to if you use this three blade retractor and expand completely up and down and medial lateral, um, you can imagine maybe there's a difference in terms of neurological injury. Um, going along the size of the incision, there is another company that came, came out with their device where they use a smaller uh, um, trauma to the psoas and hope in the hopes of decreasing um, uh, duration, um, the size of the uh, trauma to the, um, the psoas muscle. And that company, the pro, um, you know, they show these pictures, but uh, it's really, they just have end plate coverage at the most distal and most proximal areas, but in the inside, they just have a bag of bones. And we've seen some of the issues with bag of bones uh, surgery, but that is one um, way that they feel that they can help minimize trauma. So the question is, is duration or size. So improvements to the market, um, you know, if we can get better structural support, not just uh, 16 or 18 millimeter support on the contralateral and ipsilateral side, um, wouldn't that be more benefit um, for biomechanical support? as well as can we get some height expansion to help with our indirect decompression. So I think that's where um, um, Amplify's cage um, provides that uh, possibility because it expands uh, vertically as well as horizontally. So you would have a better benefit than just having a six, 16 or 18 millimeter um, 
tip and, um, and proximal and distal. So they do have various options in terms of lordosis as well as length um, to provide uh, vertical and um, more sagittal balance um, uh, compared to the other devices. So in terms of technique to adopt this, this is not by uh, the dual portal that we've been, been, been amazed with all those videos where there's a learning curve. If you're already doing a lateral procedure, um, it should not really change uh, much on what you do. If you're new to lateral because you're scared about the neural plexus by making a smaller incision, um, hopefully you're decreasing trauma to the psoas and possibly decreasing your risk for neural, neurological issues. Um, so what I've adapted to is I actually use the Stryker uh, Niagara system, which has carbon fiber blades, uh, which maximize visualization. Um, and I do use a metallic posterior blade just to, as a as a goal post to know how far posterior I can go with the expansion. Um, the, the, the key things that will differ in terms of what you will need to do is since your annular defect is small, um, roughly about, you know, for the um, Stryker Niagara cage, I believe it's um, 14 to 16 millimeter um, opening, you need to create a annular defect proximal and distal or else you can't get the cage in. Or if you don't make the cage, the annular defect on the contralateral side, the cage can spit out kind of like a watermelon seed between your fingers. So um, you need to use these expandable cobs to make a bigger annular defect once you get into the uh, disc space as well as onto the contralateral side on that far right image to make sure that your final end plate can spread evenly across the, um, the apophyseal ring. Same thing with the trial. Uh, once you get the annular defect in, you do the disc prep just like you normally do. Um, you can you need to trial this size just to make sure you, get, you can get the cage in um, um, horizontally to make sure that uh, it will not spit out. So here's a case example um, that, um, that we did. Uh, most recent, most recent case example, uh, this gentleman, I um, did an L3-4 Lamy fusion on for neurogenic claudication. His leg improved, but his back pain and thigh pain started coming back. Uh, CT showed a non-union and typical Michigan sizes BMI is 45. I'm sure the Korean surgeons do not see people that big. <laughs> but, um, you know, the screws um, and the decompression is fine. You can see haloing around the screws, but, uh, you know, I think this is a great example for a lateral procedure since you don't want to go back in the back in this big of a gentleman. So intraoperatively, um, that's the Niagara uh, retractor. Those are all carbon fiber blades. You can see on the C-arm, um, you can see much better clearly into the disc prep, um, the disc space versus um, a metallic blade. Um, I do have that posterior metallic blade uh, just to tell me how far posterior that I can go. Um, Next here is the, um, um, the trial um, where you can see the, the, the basically um, you put the retractor and you click a couple of times that will maximize go to about 16 or 18 that I try to keep it in. And you can see the cage that's expanded outside the um, boundaries of that circular diameter. Um, and then finally, you can see that cage there where you get horizontal expansion to a 22 and then the height expansion this one you won't get as much because of the screws being in place, but um, it does fill up that, that disc prep, I mean, that disc space to help with the fusion. Um, you, you can also um, uh, pre-fill the disc space and, as well as post-fill the disc space. If you are using um, flowable material, you can post-pack. If you are a believer in more um, granular, or more uh, robust kind of um, allograft chips or anything like that, uh, my recommendation is to pack it in the in the di in the uh, device prior to placing it, and then fill up the space with uh, flowable devices. But um, you can fill up that whole disc space uh, with uh, bone graft material for your healing. Um, and that was just a quick um, quick presentation on the lateral procedure. Um, I think if you are facile doing lateral procedures, I don't think this will add time. Um, but if you I think you'll get the benefit of time as well as the size of the duration, size of the um, incision by making your um, your uh, psoas dissection um, closer to a 16 to 18 millimeter versus a 22 to 26 exposure with the uh, traditional lateral approaches. Okay, thank you. Okay. This is just the one.
the one, right? Do watch Paul Yeah. Okay. I believe this should work. All right. So last talk before we get to go to the lab. I know we're running a little bit behind, so I will move along. Uh, we're talking about MIST lift, and so I really just want to talk about my experience with, uh, with the Dual X expandable cage uh, and why I came to Amplify. Like Dr. Kim, I started uh, down a social media rabbit hole, and I found Amplify on Instagram. At the time, I was frustrated with a lot of expandable cages I, I was using, and I told my rep, um, we need to find a new one, or I'll have to find a new rep. <laughs> and so, fortunately, we, we came across uh, the Dual X cage on uh, on Instagram, reached out to Andy, and we've been working together. There's a generation difference, though. Facebook right. and Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somebody else will say TikTok, but... Um, <laughs> But so that's how I got started using Amplify and been using them for a little over a year. And so some of the, the critics to expandable cages, some of the frustrations I had with previous uh, uh, cages were subsidence, sagittal alignment and, and uh, backfilling and being able to fill with graft. And so uh, some of these studies were referenced in, in previous talks, so I won't belabor the point. But uh, this study showed, you know, increased subsidence with expandable cages versus static cages. Uh, and in their conclusion, they felt there were two primary reasons. One, that the expandable cage was a uh, stress riser and that was causing subsidence. The other was that um, when they subdivided and to the, the patients that had had uh, uh, posterior column osteotomy as well, uh, they, they saw a reduction um, in subsidence, even with expandable cages. So they felt that that unilateral facetectomy, there'd be a tether on the contralateral side and that was uh, causing uh, uh, subsidence as well. But uh, there's other studies that have looked at um, the cage shape, and, and this one in particular looked at banana cages versus bullet cages and found less subsidence in the banana cages versus bullet cages. And that makes sense uh, anatomically, you know, as, as the cage is wider, as it can engage more of the apophyseal ring, you'd expect there to be less subsidence. So I think that's one of the solutions that Amplify provides is that that horizontal expansion allows you to engage uh, more laterally in, closer to the pop seal ring to minimize subsidence. And then, well, obviously, there's a lot of debate about are we kyphosing people every time we do a T-lift and, you know, causing deformity left and right. Again, this is that previous study um, that they showed that they did see improvement in sagittal alignment in both static and uh, expandable cages. I actually felt it was a little bit better in their static cages in this study. Um, there's studies on the other side of the, of the fence that say, you know, like expandable bulls are better than static cages. Um, but I think middle ground is probably right. Both of these studies conclude that you can uh, improve lower doses or you can cause kyphosis. And a lot of it depends on your technique or are you putting the cage? Are you anterior enough? Uh, what, what kind of, uh, are you using a unilateral uh, fast technique? Are you doing a, a posterior column osteotomy? All those types of things can factor into whether you're achieving lordosis in that segment or whether you're kyphosing people. So I think, you know, I choose the middle ground on this one that your, your technique matters. And then finally, uh, as you saw in some of the previous videos, uh, I think Dr. Park's video, he showed it really well. Uh, the, the, one of the elegant things about this cage is that you can really, really robustly backfill it with graft. Um, so you can get several cc's of, of DBM putty or DBM fibers. Uh, I use DBM putty with uh, bone marrow aspirate mixed together. Uh, and you can really, really backfill this cage, which I think is special. You know, some of the other expandable cages out there, you know, aren't able to backfill. And I think that's part of the reason why you see um, some of the higher non-union rates in some of those, with some of those uh, cages. Uh, so if you're here today, you probably already are interested in MIS stuff. If you're looking to do get even more minimally invasive and do dual port portals, so an MIST lift to use probably not super revolutionary. So I'll skip through some of this stuff. Um, one of the minor changes I've made in my practice when I when I switched to um, the dual X cage was I, I use a 20 millimeter tape tube now instead of the 18. I think 18. It's doable, and we did it for the first couple, but you know, I think that two extra millimeters just help a little bit visualization and, and retraction. Um, so that's a, a minor change that I've made. Um, and then the, the one thing, you know, as the image shows with your angle versus, versus with a T-lift versus a PLIF, you gotta be mindful of that as well. 
particularly at more cranial levels, um, you want to make sure that your tube is not too medially uh, placed so that uh, you're not overly retracting. And there is a, a, a PLIF cage that's a little bit uh, shorter uh, once it expands versus the T-lift cage. I believe that the PLIF cage, uh, once it expands, it's 25 millimeters versus the T-lift cage, which is 30. So if you have a patient that you feel it's a little bit smaller uh, of a patient, you could always switch to the PLIF cage and still get that uh, horizontal expansion to 21, but just a little shorter cage. I mean, the other thing is um, you, from a disc prep standpoint, you know, this isn't a cage where you could throw, you know, just a shaver in once and then throw the cage in. Uh, you really have to do a, a wide discectomy to um, allow it to expand and fill up that space because it is a large footprint. Um, I do less pre-packing now of the disc space than I did in the past. I used to, you know, try to use all of my autograph from the facetectomy and really pack the, the disc space. Uh, but again, you have to allow for the expansion of this cage and you really want to get it anterior in the disc space. So this is one of my failures uh, on my learning curve of using it where I, I think I uh, wasn't able to get the cage anterior enough because of some of the prepacking that we did. Um, and so still a little bit proud and ended up causing some contralateral radicular pain and we had to revise it. Now, the one good thing about this cage is it's actually easier to revise than I thought it was going to be. Um, getting the screw out and getting it to collapse is actually pretty straightforward and pretty simple, which is nice if you if you ever have to do that. And then the other thing uh, from a technical standpoint is uh, appropriate fluoroscopy. And, and again, on Dr. Park's video, he showed that you want to make sure that you get an AP shot uh, as you're expanding it horizontally to make sure that it's not uh, malrotated because you don't want it to dig into the end plates because that's hard to correct if that happens. I've done that too. So um, really want to make sure you get the appropriate fluoroscopic shots before uh, you fully expand it. So a couple quick cases, spondies like everybody else's with some stenosis. Um, but the big thing here is uh, on the left, again, you, you want to take that AP shot as you're expanding it, it and it's horizontally to make sure that um, you're in line with your end plates. And then you'll get your vertical expansion after that. Uh, and as Dr. Park said, it's all, you know, one uh, sweeping motion with the inserter, which is really nice. You just keep turning it uh, clockwise and expands both ways for you. And so that's that final shot. I'll skip this next case in this, for the sake of time, but similar to level T lift. Uh, and then we'll talk about this third case. So this, one of the things, I don't think it's been said today, but if you look at the website or, and some of the other talks, uh, there's this talk of, this, of, of the, being like a mini a lift and so um, obviously it's not an a lift but the a lift is still a very very powerful tool and there's a lot of benefits of it but depending on where you are and who you're working with um, having uh, competent access surgeons might be challenging um, how facile they are and, and, and getting you down there might be an issue and so you know having a, a solution that you can employ by yourself um, would be is nice also and so this case this patient Unfortunately, had multiple procedures, had a microdisc, had a revision microdisc, had some back pain, ultimately ended up with a fusion uh, at 5-1. Several months later, got in a car accident, re-herniated, uh, a couple more microdiscectomies later, uh, ended up with a fusion at the adjacent level. Um, so yeah, so far right, see her first fusion, she had an A-lift with posterior fixation, then she went all through through those series of unfortunate events that caused her to end up with the fusion at four or five. But the one thing about this one is you can kind of see side by side, right? Um, the A-lift cage at, the, uh, at five one and the dual X cage at four or five. So it's a pretty robust and large footprint and not quite um, to, to the width of an A-lift, but uh, in the ballpark. So you can get really great uh, coverage large expansion and then great vertical expansion as well um, with this cage, which is really nice to be able to do it all from a posterior position. So uh, in the lab today, um, I know dual portal is what you're here for, and you got some great uh, physicians here who will be walking you through that. But if you get bored and want to just play with the cage from a T-lift standpoint, there's a station for that too. Um, I think, you know, as, as Dr. Kim said, this is, you know, the, 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 Dual portal is just the appetizer. You're just getting exposed to it, but many of you are probably already doing MIST lifts. So uh, if you're interested in checking this out, I think it's a great cage for that application and can really help your practice and we'll have a station for that. So that's it.
Okay, so I want to thank all the speakers this morning for the great lectures that you've given us. Now is what we all came for, right? Uh, oh, shit, excuse me. Um, so on your badges, the participants, you will have stations assigned to you, right? Either color or number, something like that. So those are the stations that you should go to. Don't go to your friend's station just because you want to hang out with your friends. Because um, we have large number of people and we want to make sure that equal number of people are divided among the uh, uh, different uh, cadavers. Yes, Ms. Chang, you had a question. You raised your hand. OK, so. <laughs> The the numbers were assigned to the, the the way they assigned it was like dependent on the surgeons. So and then their residents, fellows, and I believe etc. that were not assigned, right? So let's see have so the, the fact the attendings go and then we'll divvy up the, the remaining equally so there's no chaos, I think. Right, Andy? So okay. Like I said, we'll just the first, you know, portion is what watching, and then we'll come back, have lunch, and we'll go back again. Okay,